Hey guys, welcome back to the Pulling Curls podcast. Today we have a bonus episode. We're talking about boobies. Let's untangle it. I'm Hillary Erickson, the curly head behind the Pulling Curls podcast, where we untangle pregnancy, parenting, home, and even travel. We know there's no right answer for every family, but hopefully we can spark some ideas that will work for yours. Life's tangled, just like my hair. Hey guys, before we get started, just go ahead and leave a review or subscribe. Either one, you know, choice is up to you. Today's guest has been a friend for a long time. We have kids of similar ages and we lived in the San Jose area together, but she is the lucky recipient of stage four metastatic breast cancer. And I've been following her journey on Instagram and I just thought she had some inspirational words for all of us and the things that she's learned during her treatment. So I want to introduce today's guest, Anjali Pettingill. Hey, Anjali, welcome to the Pulling Curls podcast. Hi. Yes. So Anjali and I are old friends. How old is your oldest? Okay. So um, Evie is 14 and I can't remember. So we met in San Jose. Yep. um, And I, uh, had I given birth to her? No, I had it. Uh, I think you had her while we were there, right? Because I think I had given you advice she was breech or yes. something, right? Oh, yeah, that was right. So Spencer is 17, almost 18. And then I had a baby like two years after you had Evie. Yeah. And then you had your daughter and I had Owen. It like like We were like a week apart. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. But you probably had your baby way before me because I went so overdue. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember. But yes, you were like, whenever I had any pregnancy questions or anything, like it was always nice, like having you to turn to. <laughs> so. Oh, people at church love me. I, I know. <laughs> yeah. All right. So Anjali was telling me yesterday she was a chemo because uh, what's your official diagnosis, Anjali? So I have um, stage four, also known as metastatic breast cancer. And with metastatic breast cancer, I, I'm, I'll go into this more, but you, you know, basically what that means that it has, it spread past my breasts and it's now in my bones. So, okay. Is it just in your bones or have they found it other places? It is in my bones and in my bone marrow. So um, up until this point, that's all, you know, all I know. So yeah, it hasn't last, last pet scan. That's the only places where it was. So good. Stay there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's rewind. How did you find it? Okay. So I will start from the very beginning. So it was like February, 2020. I was just getting dressed one morning and I happened to feel a lump on my boob, but I had actually had felt the lump about a week earlier. So like for as long as I can remember, I have had had um, fibrous cystic breasts, um, which I talked to my gynecologist about and he had confirmed that was it was something that was normal and, and common. And basically what that means is that my breasts would get kind of lumpy and sore around my cycle, but it would always go away about a week later. Um, so it's like, I noticed, I'm like, oh, it's, you know, about at that time, like, you know, I got, I got some lumps, things are a little sore, but I felt this lump and I'm like, wait, you know, I've got this lump and I, I'm not sore anymore. And it was in a spot where I usually didn't get lumps. And so I was like, okay, this is a little concerning. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I like just kind of like wrote it off. I'm like, maybe I'm just being dramatic. Like it was kind of crazy. Like about that same time, like I had like a sweet friend in my ward who had just passed away. I, I just attended her funeral um, and she passed away from metastatic breast cancer and was young, like just a little bit older. She was like in her early 40s. Um, and I had another friend who had just been diagnosed with breast cancer. And my sister-in-law, a few months before that, had just been diagnosed. So it was definitely something that was fresh on my mind. Um, so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to call my gynecologist and get in. And I got into my gynecologist and he um, he told me that he didn't think it was anything. He's like, you know, it might just be like a sw- swollen lymph node. But um, he's like, let's just get you in for a mammogram and also like a diagnostic diagnostic ultrasound. And then we'll go from there. Um, but he like 
kind of, he's like, I don't, I think you're fine. I don't think it's anything, you know? And so, you know what? I didn't worry about it. I totally convinced myself. I'm like, I'm young, I'm healthy. I exercise, like I'm doing everything right. Like, you know, it's just like breast cancer is not going to happen to me. It happens to other people, not to me, you know, like. Yeah. How old were you? I was 35. So. Okay. And had you had a mammogram before? I had never had a mammogram. Um, never needed Which to. Which would be normal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're, you're not like, it's 40, right? Isn't that? It is 40 unless you have a history in your family, like Evie will want to get checked yeah. early on. Right. Yeah. If you had a history of a young person in your family having breast cancer. Yeah. So yeah. So the next step, like I felt like everything, you know, just took a while like, to get, like it took about like a, like a week and a half to get in for the mammogram. And, you know, I was really nervous about the mammogram for some reason I thought it was going to be so painful. Um, like that's a, I, for some reason I had that idea in my head and it's not like for me, I didn't feel like it's awkward, super awkward, but it wasn't painful. Um, and then they did the ultrasound and it was really nice. The radiologist, he came in like not too long after that. And you know, like you get your results back immediately. You don't have to wait. And he said that, um, you know, there's definitely something there, but it didn't have all of the qualities of breast cancer. But he's like, I think that we should, um, still get it biopsied just to completely rule it out. Um, and with a biopsy, that's like the only like for sure way to know if it's cancerous. So that was the next step. And it was right about this point that like the pandemic, like everything was kind of starting to like really hit. Like that's when like food was flying off the shelves and everybody was worried about toilet paper. I don't think I wasn't quite to the point yet. I don't think my kids had, they had like canceled school yet. Um, but that's about like where I was at. And so I remember when I like called to schedule the biopsy and get that going that it took a lot longer because it was, they were only doing like medically necessary procedures. And so they had to like verify with other people to make sure it was, I needed this immediately. And so it was all like pretty frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Especially for a breast biopsy. It's not like you go in just for fun. Right. For that one. I know. I know. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. And the breast biopsy, it was, I was nervous about that too. It was not fun. <laughs> um, basically, you know, what they do is it's guided by an ultrasound and they take a giant needle and stab it into that, you know, lump and um, pull out tissue to test. And they have to do it multiple times to make sure that they have got enough tissue. So do they numb you for that? They do numb you, but I still, it's still like, I could still feel a lot of it, you yeah. know, because it's yeah. like so just invasive. But um, yeah, so and then it took, they told me it took it would take about a week um, to get the results back from that. And it, the results went back to my gynecologist. And I like I was like the super annoying, like patient and like was calling my doctor's office like every single day, like I just wanted to know I'm like, yeah. I just want to know, like, just like, have that relief. I was still convinced. I was still like totally convinced that it was going to be nothing. Like, but yeah, and it took about a week to get those results back. And then finally he called me. Yeah. I just remember that phone call. Like the first thing he said, he was like, I just want you to know that it's malignant. Um, and I was like, right going through my head. I'm like, I couldn't remember. I'm like, is malignant? I'm like, does that mean it's cancerous or not? Like, <laughs> I'm like which one is that? But no, he confirmed it pretty quick that yeah, it was cancerous. But he's like, I think we've caught it early. I had actually three months before that had been in to, for my like regular like pap smear like checkup you know like everything was normal then I even had blood work done everything was normal he was just like no I think that we have definitely we're on top of this we've caught it early where he went over like it was still like a really hard conversation like I still like he went off about like all like the different type of cancer I had and what that meant and everything and I like remember I heard none of it right I was just like holy crap, like he just told me I had breast cancer. But it's like the next steps were that I needed to find an oncologist and I needed a breast MRI and I needed to find a surgeon and it was pretty overwhelming. So yeah, so the next steps after that was to, I got the MRI and then I met with my oncologist and that was hard because at that point they weren't allowing anybody to come to any of like any appointments just because people were so 
so scared, you know, still about coronavirus. And like, that was like when we were in like the depths, I felt like of the lockdown, like where everything yeah. felt so uncertain. Yeah. So my first appointment with the oncologist, he confirmed that the MRI had shown that the breast cancer was a little bit bigger than what they had normally saw on the mammogram, but there was no lymph node involvement. So he's like, you know, I think we've caught it early, but he's like, because it is a little bigger, we're going to start chemo right away. Because usually what they do, if it's caught earlier, like if it's still like stage one, then they do surgery first. It's surgery and then chemo or if it's, but if it's a little bit bigger, then they'll do chemo first. So that was the plan. Start chemo like right away. And so that's kind of what we decided. And like as I was like getting ready to leave the appointment, I just happened to ask him, I'm like, I'm like, so how do you know that if, it, if it's spread or not? And he was like, well, you have no lymph node involvement. So he's like, it's not something that we need to worry about. He's like, but you know, if it make you feel better, like we can order a PET scan. And I was like, yeah, like, I think I would like that. So that was the next step. I got the PET scan and I was getting everything set up to start chemo. And then I got a call from him with the results from this PET scan. And he let me know that it had spread to my bones. And that was a really hard call to to process. Not only it was, I just remember him like reading off it, like all the bones that it was in. It was in my hips, like multiple places in my hip bones. It was at multiple places in my spine, my ribs, my in my shoulders. Um, so I was just like, no, like this isn't happening. Like I remember like on the phone call, I told him, I'm like, and he told, and at this point he's like, you know, he's like, we will treat your cancer differently. Now we don't have the intent anymore to cure you. He told the, the intent was now just um, to just to treat me like so that, you know, just to like live as long as possible. Um, and I yeah. was like, no, I'm like, I, I, I'm going to have a clear PET scan. I'm going to beat this. Like, I'm not like, I just, I didn't accept it. Um, like you just, I'm like, no, this, this, this is not how it's going to go. <laughs> like, but so at that point, were you, did they say it was basically incurable? Yeah. Right. Yes. He told That's me. what he was saying. It was, yeah. it was, it was incurable at this point. Um, yeah. So yeah, I was just like, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not accepting that. And, and it took, so my treatment plan completely changed. Um, at that point, they're like, we'll put you on chemo was like kind of taken off the table. They did give me the option, but they're like, at this point, we don't know, we even know how helpful it would be. But there was other drugs that I could take that could all, you know, that work and were good drugs and could help keep everything under control. And so I, I opted for those. And then they also, you know, my breast cancer was hormone positive. So so they immediately put me into medical menopause, um, which shut down my ovaries. And also um, they give you drugs like, you know, to stop any other parts of your body, you know, that make estrogen. Um, so that was fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is fun at 35. <laughs> I know, to all of a sudden be in menopause. And oh my gosh, like, and it's not the really the worst part. It's a hot flash. It's like, I have some pretty intense hot flashes. <laughs> but yeah, so that, it was kind of um, where, you know, where things were going. And I was like, just kind of took this attitude. Like I was in full blown denial. <laughs> and I was just like, I am going to do like, I'm not listening to the doctors, you know, like I knew I wanted to take an integrative approach, um, you know, like, so I'm like, okay, like the medical like system can't cure me, but I'm like, I just have this belief, like I can cure myself. So I'm like, I'm going to do everything I can. I started reading for like two months straight. All I did was read about different ways, <laughs> to, to what supplements, what foods, what everything I started and, you know, anything to anybody had said it helped them and to cure their cancer. And so I went vegan. I started juicing. I was drinking like six glasses of vegetable juice a day. I started turning, I was drinking so much carrot juice. Like I started turning orange. <laughs> You're pretty fair skin to start with, Anjali. So that's not super surprising. <laughs> I should send you some pictures because it is like, <laughs> it's crazy. I was like really orange, you know, and I just like was having the hardest time. Just, I don't know. 
just accepting everything because it's, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Did you go to like a naturopath or anything? Um, or was it just all your own research? I, it was mostly my own research. And I was reaching out like anybody I could find online. I reached out to quite a few people online and asked them questions about what they were doing and what had helped them. And, you know, but at that point, I, I hadn't met with a naturopathic doctor. And yeah, and so things were steady. Like my blood counts were good. Like, you know, my tumor markers were staying good, like everything for about like four or five months. And then my tumor markers started going up, which through this process I have, my tumor markers are usually a pretty good indication of progression. And then my next PET scan did show that I was having progression. And it was so frustrating because I'm like, I'm doing all of this stuff, you know, and none of it's working. And and it's just been, it's been like such a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. So I was so frustrated. And at that point, I'm like, maybe we just need to do chemo. Like my doctor, I've also have switched oncologists a few different times. <laughs> yeah, because you want to try and find somebody that's a good fit and that will fix it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. But my oncologist I was with at this point, she was really just like kind of put it in my hands. She's like, you can decide. She's like, if you want to do chemo, that's fine. We could try a different drug. We could do. And after thinking about it and hearing about it, I'm like, I just felt right about doing chemo. I had also went and had a second opinion from another oncologist. And so I went on chemo. This was like last fall. I did six rounds of chemo and finished in March. March. And, and like, I was still just kind of like had that mindset, like, I'm going to beat this. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, like I was still, I had eased up like during chemo, I had started eating meat and doing, you know, just like realized that I, you know, while my body was going through that, I, I needed a little bit more and I needed care for my body and a little bit different ways yeah. than I had been before. So, but as soon as I was done for chemo, I remember, and I was still just like searching for whatever I could find. Like I actually, like about a year ago, I'm like, I realized like I started meditating. I read a lot about meditation and how good it is for you. And, you know, and so I like was meditating like every day for almost an hour, like most days. And I'm, I'm like, okay, this is going to be it. Once, you know, that's like my, it was my missing link and everything was like, you know, meditating. And so I meditated for a long time and I finished chemo. I still, I was hoping that chemo would get me into remission and it didn't. There was, my PET scans were getting better, but it still wasn't clear. And then um, I went on to a different drug and was still doing, like I went back on my diet. I wasn't juicing quite as much as I was. And that drug worked for a few months. And then uh, my next PET scan, which was over the summer, came back with more progression, but still in my bones, just in my bones. Thankfully, nothing has spread past my bones. Um, and so in, in the, at that point, um, I ended up having another biopsy and my cancer is so tricky because <laughs> like, my cancer had mutated and it's not quite as strongly estrogen and progression gesture and fed anymore. And um, there's also something with breast cancer called um, the HER2 protein, which can feed your breast cancer. Death. So that's like when I was originally diagnosed, um, I was HER2 positive. So my breast cancer was considered triple positive. Um, and now it was no longer HER2 positive. But my current doctor I was with, she because my cancer was being so aggressive, she's like, I really think that, that your biopsies are wrong, that you're still her too positive. And it just didn't sit right with me. I'm like, I, I don't know. Like, so she wanted, she had like this completely different direction. She wanted a, my treatment to go in and I just didn't feel right about it. And that's one thing like in this process is I it's just like I'm learning to trust myself and what I felt was right. And so at that point, I ended up switching to a different oncologist. And I'm so thankful that I did. Like I honestly, if I hadn't switched, I don't know if I would be here because the new oncologist like immediately um, was like, something is not right. Like my blood counts were all dropping like really quickly. I like I had gone in and I needed, my platelets were really low and I needed a platelet infusion. And then it's like my hemoglobin started dropping. She's like, okay, well, we 
need to admit you to the hospital and, and really figure out what's going on. And at that point, they were like growing up, like possibly like a secondary cancer, like leukemia or something like that. But um, so I got to spend a few weeks in the hospital. And um, that was close to the holidays, right? Yeah, well, it was beginning of October. So, okay. yeah. And it was kind of nice because I feel like everything happened so slow. But it was like once I was in the hospital, like I had a bone marrow biopsy. It was like every like they did, you know, I had another scan. Like um, it's just like things happened a lot faster. And, and it came back that the breast cancer had taken over my bone marrow. And so they suggested um, starting me on another chemo like right away to try to get a hold of everything. And so I was getting chemo, I was getting chemo in the hospital and then also getting daily blood and platelet transfusions. And it was hard. <laughs> it was rough. Like I, uh, you know, nobody re- had real definite answers. Like they weren't telling me like how long I would be there, how, you know, what, what the chances of this actually working were. It was just like, it was a really scary time. Definitely the hardest point of like this whole experience of dealing with breast cancer. Um, but it also, those like few weeks, like really helped me to just kind of change my perspective on everything. I just like, it, I remembered this conversation that I had had with a friend um, who she had had a lot of, or has a lot of health challenges and she had had a heart and lung transplant um, quite a few years ago. But I remember talking to her right after I was diagnosed and she told me how she couldn't really, you know, to kind of come to like peace with everything. She's like, I had to just accept the fact that, you know, I could die on the operating table. You know, she's like, I just had to like accept that. And at the time, it was so hard for me to hear that because I, to me, I'm like, that felt like, like giving up. I'm like, yeah. And, and I, I, where I was at, I was like, no, like, I, I was like, no, that's not my attitude. Like, I'm going to beat this. I mean, but when I was in the hospital, I just, I realized I'm like, we're all dying. Like, I, you know, like, I just kind of accepted that fact. It's like, I have no idea when I'm going to die of breast cancer. But I mean, uh, hopefully, it's not for another 20 years. Hopefully, it's like not, you know, that or, or longer. But it's just like, I, you know, I realized that I could accept that outcome and still have hope. Yes. You know, that it just like facing, I think we don't like, I don't know, like, it's, it's like, we don't want to face the fact <laughs> that we're all dying. Like we are. That's like well, no, we have no control, and we have no control. There, you couldn't work your way out of this mess, right? Yeah, I'm like, I can do whatever. I, uh, I, I can focus on eating healthy. I can focus on meditating and everything, but still, I have no control over the outcome. And honestly, like in accepting that, like it has been so freeing and just like a weight has been lifted off of me. I'm like, and it's, it's like, I still, I still eat healthy. I still am doing, you know, like I, I still have a lot of hope, but it's just like that just released from just accepting that like has been so huge for me. <laughs> no, I can totally see that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But, How did husband and kids tolerate all this? Anything you want to share about that? We have, it, it's hard, like, because I try to talk to my kids, uh, you know, check in on them, like, you know, on a regular basis, like, what are you thinking about things? You know what? I feel like we've just kind of like gotten into the groove, a new groove. (laughs) Yeah. And it's hard. It's hard because it's like this, this diagnosis has also forced me to like, really just embrace the present. Like I really have learned just to take things one day at a time. And that gets kind of hard when it comes to like planning a vacation or because we just don't ever know what things are going to look like in a month. That has been tricky and juggling that. But it, it's just like giving me the chance to just like every day I'm just, I wake up and I'm just like, I am alive. I am here. Like I, I'm going to make the very most out of this day because this is what I have and I don't know about anything else. And so, yeah. That really is the one thing you can control, right? It, it is. It's your outlook, your perspective. It is. <laughs> that is what I have kind of learned to just focus on. I love that. What have people done that has been helpful to you? A lot. <laughs> I, I have been surround. Um, I like just feel so blessed to have such an amazing support system and so many friends who have been there for me 
Yeah. But one thing that has been huge, it's always just like, like my friends who remember the days that I am having chemo and we'll even just like it's a simple text, like, Hey, just thinking about you today. Like hope everything goes well at treatment. Like even little things like that, like just, just helps me to, to know that I'm not alone in this, you know? And like, it's not like the big things. Like I, you know, there are people have done like, you know, who have given me like amazing like gifts and which I, I do appreciate and they do make me feel loved, but just, but it's like those, those little texts also like have, are so, so huge for me. I love that because your friends feel real hopeless as well, you know? So it is nice that small things make a big deal. That's good to know. Yeah, they do. I know I'm trying to think if there's anything else, but I know I do feel really blessed. Like I've just been like surrounded by so many loving people. Anything people have done for your kids? When I was like in the hospital, you know, it was so nice. Friends who like, you know, offered to do, uh, you know, to pick up from school and things like that, like we're just like so helpful. So yeah, just like the mechanics of your life they're helping with. Yeah, yeah. Because it was like, you know, like I was I wasn't there anymore. And things still needed they still needed rides and picked up and my daughter does band I was doing late night band practices. And yeah, so we had a family who also ended up coming into town to help Todd's mom and my mom. And yeah, so it all worked out. All right. So it sounds like control is the big thing you've learned during all this. Yes. Yeah. Is recognizing those things that I do and don't have control over and, and accepting them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that is the hard part was it just accepting that and yeah yeah that's a good lesson for all of us were you a big self exam doer before this okay so i remember you know like going to the gynecologist and like getting this like pamphlet that was like all the things like you, you, that you should do it's like you rub like you rub this way and that way and you live in, uh, and and it was so confusing and i and i didn't to follow that and what i found was it's like i would regularly check my breasts. Like I knew my breasts. I knew what was normal. I knew that I got lumps around my period and I knew where those lumps usually were. And so it's like, I would feel my breasts. I knew what was normal. I knew that one of my breasts was a little teeny bit bigger than the other. Yep. You know, it's like, I did, I did check them regularly, but it's like, I didn't follow the, like, that's, you know, the standard, like, this is what you do. Like, uh, like that you check, but like certain, I don't know. I don't, I don't even really remember, but I remember it was like, you rub one way and then rub the other way and then you use two fingers and then <laughs> it is really confusing when in reality you just like during your shower you just like soap it up and see what's up there <laughs> right yeah <laughs> yeah so but really i think the the key is just to know what is normal for you and it's not just with your breasts but with your your entire body it's like make sure you're checking all your moles like you know what all your moles look like you know tracking your cycle know what you know what a normal menstrual cycle is for you like i think it's so important just to know your normal because it's different for everyone yeah my doctor actually told me they had stopped telling people to do self exams which i was like are you kidding me because all of my friends that have found their found it through self-exams. <laughs> Yeah. And I know I've heard that lately that they're not recommending that. And they're also thinking about, or maybe they already have, but I think they're the mammogram age. They were moving up to 45. I've heard something about that too, but I'm like, yeah, no, <laughs> no. And it's also like really heartbreaking to me, like in the different forums that I'm on quite a few different, like on Facebook, like metastatic breast cancer forums and how many times I hear women talk about how they found a lump when they were breastfeeding feeding and their doctor just wrote it off as like a clogged, a clogged milk duct. And so by the time they were finally diagnosed, they were already stage four. And I'm like, you know, you really have to advocate for yourself. Like if something, if you, something does not feel right, then it's like, you really have to push, especially I feel like for younger women, I feel like with doctors, a lot of times it's like, they don't take it as serious because they're, you, you know, you're young. Yeah. Well, and I like what you really said at the beginning is a lot of times you'll have a lump for a week right? Yeah. So give yourself that week, like take a note in the shower. Okay, I need to check that again, you know, after my cycle's done or whatever. But if it's still there, push. Yeah. Sometimes you have to push. Yeah. But just like a clogged milk duct, like if it is not going away, like, you know, yeah. then, then have it checked out. <laughs> Good to know. I know. All right, Anjali, thank you so much for coming on. I think you are a brave warrior for even sharing your story. And hopefully it helps a lot of people maybe in similar situations or just moms that need to let go of some control in some areas. 
area of their life. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on and letting me share my story. Yeah. Thanks, Anjali. Oh, guys, the whole time she was talking about like things we don't have control over and how we can try and work our way out of things that we really can't work our way out of. I really felt that. I don't know. Did you guys feel that too? So thanks so much to Anjali for coming on. That was a great episode. And I hope you guys learned a little bit something about both breast cancer and making sure that you know your own body, but also going through hard stuff. And sometimes you just don't have control and you have to let that go. Thanks so much for joining us on today's episode. We know you have lots of options for your ears and we are glad that you chose us. We drop episodes weekly, and until next time, we hope you have a tangle-free day.